my name's Conrad Doucette. This is Annie Nero, and this is Steve Silberman, um, author of Neuro Tribes, as well as famously um, a deadhead, as we all are here, <laughs> <coughs> and as I think many of you tuning in are. Um, so why don't we begin with The Grateful Dead, which is why we're all here. Let's talk about The Grateful Dead and our connection to it. Um, Steve, you go first. Sure. Um, when I was 14, I went to see the Allman Brothers, actually, at Watkins Glen. Uh, and uh, the Allman Brothers were playing with the band and the Grateful Dead. 1973. I, right, right. And um, the Dead came out the day before the concert was supposed to start because so many people were there already and just did a sound check. And the sound check turned into a, uh, like nearly 20 minutes of the most beautiful, completely improvised music that they ever played in their entire career. And I had never seen anything like that. And uh, the fact that they were able to be geniuses spontaneously completely blew my mind, and I was hooked. And uh, so I went to see them a couple of hundred more times <laughs> after that, for you know, basically until uh, Jerry died. Um, and it was uh, a great way to grow up. Well, um, I'm glad you didn't blow my mind with that <laughs> factoid before we went online. I can't believe you were at that Watkins Glen show. I know all about it, and I've, I've listened to that. Um, amazing. So with me, I, I got into the Grateful Dead as a teenager, and I started going to see them in the 90s. On the spring tour of 1990 was my first show, and I ended up seeing them over 30 times. Saw a Jerry Band show, too. And um, what's amazing is I remember the, the beginning of the first which was March 21st, 1990 at the Copt Coliseum in Hamilton, Ontario. And it was Mississippi Half Step, which is the version they use on Without a Net, actually. And I'm standing in the lower bowl at the back with my, with my buddy, stage in front of us, and tuning, and people are getting hyped. And then they start playing the song, and I wasn't prepared for this, but 18,000 people just start moving, and this is all in front of me. That's and at that point, I realized that was, I, it was one of the very few literal jaw-dropping moments in my life and I looked around and it was very clear that there was something larger than a, any single person at work. Right. Um, it was not only this this musical um, journey which of course I was already into and I was excited to see but there, there was something more that connected people's minds, bodies and relationships with each other and it was mind-blowing and after that I was hooked. I was reading stuff, I was buying dead bass, I was trading tapes I went to see them that summer, and then after that I went over throughout the early 90s up to the end of their career, and I was at their final two shows in Chicago. Um, and I've just been a fan ever since. I've made friends through it. I've played music because of it. Um, and you produce or you create, help create yeah. the Amazing Day of the Dead Project album. Yeah, so I got to be, um, I had the opportunity to be a part of this great team that put together the Day of the Dead Project, which was um, a red hot release to benefit global HIV and AIDS charities and I did that with um, my good friends um, Aaron and Bryce Dessner and Brian and Scott Devendorf and Josh Kaufman and we roped in just dozens of the greatest artists working right now and it was just an honor and a thrill to hear what they what they brought to the table and how you can hear the, the Grateful Dead songwriting interpreted by a brand new generation. That's wonderful. Um, Annie Nero. Yeah, I'm. I'm afraid to say this after after your um, after what you guys have said, but I'm a later in life convert. So I got into them about five years ago, um, and I got in through through American Beauty. Actually, that was my gateway drug. Um, the second I heard Box of Rain, I was I was in that song. Just kind of like sticks to your ribs in a way. It just feels like home, and I kind of just that took off from there. Um, and ever since then, I've I've been I've been listening, and one of the amazing things that I think about the dead is what you were speaking to about the audience. It's some of the most open-minded people I've ever met in my entire life, and I don't think that exists with other with other bands. I feel like there's this thing that happens where there's like a who versus sort of thing. Like if you like the Stones, you don't like the Beatles. If you like the Beatles, you don't. But the I feel like dead fans are just open to everything, and they've been we very welcoming of me, as Conrad has. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I mean this uh, conversation is part of a 92nd Street Y series of conversations about the nature of genius. So what I wanted to know is, and you uh, 
worked on Blue Mountain, the Bob mm-hmm. Weir album, mm-hmm. and you worked on the Day of the Dead project. How did you experience the nature of the Grateful Dead genius? Like an interesting question is, genius is usually located in one person. And, you know, some people think that the genius of the Grateful Dead was Jerry Garcia. Um, I would suggest actually that what Conrad was saying about what was happening in front of his eyes at that show, where it was sort of a collective experience and it was being created by everyone in the audience, I think that was built into the dead because of their history with playing the acid tests in the early days when they weren't even a band doing a gig on a stage. They weren't like the celebrity band doing a gig. They paid a dollar to get in to drink the Kool-Aid and then they could play or not as they chose to. And that set up a paradigm of sort of collective genius, I would say, or the possibility of collective improvisatory genius on, on any night. What was it like as you were sort of uh, assigning songs to bands to do the Day of the Dead, how did you think about what was great about these songs and who would be right for them? We, l- we approached it two, uh, two ways. Um, we had songs that we knew we wanted to do, and some of those songs weren't the ones that were obvious that you'd expect. Um, Scarlet Begonias isn't on Day of the Dead. Like, there's no Scarlet Fire. We tried to do it at the very end, but we ran out of time. Mm. Um, the other one, which a number of us had actually played with Bob a few years before on a, te- a headcount telecast, webcast wasn't on there. Um, but we wanted to lay me down to be on there. Um, so, for example, talking about to lay me down, that was, a, that was a song that we knew we wanted on it, but we weren't sure who would do it. So it was in the back of our heads. And we were putting this together over months, lots of email threads, and we all realized that we were big fans of um, Perfume Genius, amazing, um, amazing artist, and, um, but not one you would associate with the Grateful Dead or anyone near that in, in the musical sphere. And um, it was one of those, there's five of us on the email throwing back and forth, whoa, how about this or how about this? How about to lay me down? Like, oh, that might work. An email gets sent out a few days later. All right, every, everyone's in agreement. Great. And then a month later, two months later, a few weeks later, get a track back in the mail. And just, wow. Okay. That worked out perfectly. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had a, a great experience just the other night, actually. I was listening to uh, Playing in the Band from, uh, from the album. And I was completely blissing out because, of course, I saw the dead play that song many 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 times in many different incarnations of them and uh so i was experiencing these familiar sort of waves of ecstasy but in a completely different musical vocabulary because it doesn't sound much like the way the dead would have done it uh and lee ronaldo who's on that track i happen to know went to a bunch of dead shows back in the day with one of my best friends from oberlin actually so i knew how much of a deadhead lee was but I was so great, uh, greatly appreciative of how bold they were in reconceptualizing, you know, this canonical jam, really. Well, that afternoon that we recorded that was, was an amazing, beautiful afternoon because Lee is an amazing and beautiful person and musician. Yeah. So he arrives. We did it at, at a Dreamland Studios church in Woodstock. Um, and he's familiar with it. And um, uh a winter day, you know, the light is low and harsh, coming in through these beautiful stained glass windows. Lee walks in, just starts setting up his stuff. We have no real discussion on how we're going to do playing in the band, but um, Scott Devendorf and Josh Kaufman had suggested to Lee perhaps a bit of a motoric, like a German chugging, and Lee just looks up from his pedal board, which he's setting up. Motoric? Sounds great. Let's do it. And when we record, we, 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 we did two takes, and... I wish we could have kept doing it all day because it was so much fun. But just picture all of us just enthralled with what Lee's doing during the solo. And it lifted everyone. And meanwhile, beams of sunshine coming through the window. And I think that was one of those moments where it was, it was the sum is greater than the parts. Like the yeah. collective came together, led by this source of light, this beam. Yeah. And, that, and that was Lee. It was yeah. such a beautiful, beautiful moment. And when it was done, and you know, everyone takes a breath, stop recording it's just like joyous laughter that's wonderful in in the room yeah yeah that's great um 
as m many people watching this know, uh, there's a, a documentary about the band uh, coming out in May called Long Strange Trip. And uh, one of the things that Jerry says in the documentary is that, of course, he started out playing bluegrass music and old time music with like, jug bands and, and stuff. And he says that what that suggested to him was a way of organizing music where, as he put it, the instruments would talk to each other. And I think that was a way of sort of tapping the individual genius of each band member to create something that was greater than the sum of its parts. I, I, can, I think that actually we can discuss something really neat um, going on that because what Annie did on Blue Mountain and what Annie did um, singing with Bob on the Campfire Tour in the fall, um, you sang you sing with your vocal group the bandana splits so you brought in basically a trio a, a, a collective into a collective already how did bob react to that or how was bob inspired or what was bob's take on everything wow well it was a surreal experience and he he was amazing he can't we just we came in he kind of just like it was like we had been there the whole time we only sang on one of the shows at the cap theater it was kind of like we had been here the whole time he just turned around and he was like you guys got this one? And then we s played a song and it was like, it all gelled and it was amazing. And actually it was, a, it was a, an incredible experience because they had already been rehearsing, the band had been rehearsing all day. Um, and we rehearsed for a few hours and sound check was over and we were gonna sing playing, uh, sorry, um, Uncle John's band. And we were like, you know what? I think we could, I think we could kind of like work on that one a little bit more. We just really want to get those harmonies. And he's like, all right, let's go backstage. We'll work on it after he had been playing all day. So it was, it was incredible to be in a in a small space with Bob, rehearsing Uncle John's band. That's it great. Was, yeah, I mean, I, 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 yeah. I think <laughs> one thing that I also noticed in in doing some recording with Bob and, and performing with him is that he's very trusting. Uh. Yes, he's yes. very he's very trusting of his fellow musicians, um, and is also very in tune with them. He gives you space, but if he hears something um, that he wants you to follow through on or develop, he'll say that. Mm. Even if it's just with eye contact, or yeah. even if it's with a, with a musical expression, um, I, I think I think just the life that Bob has led and the personality he has, he's very he's very into he's trusting of others' inspiration, and, yeah, and yeah. talent, yeah, yeah, and he's very willing to have it to just throw it into the mix and have that serve the greater good. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. Was there a moment when Bob made a musical choice that really surprised you that you thought was Oh, I mean, the whole show that was happening. <laughs> it's hard mm -hmm. to think of one thing. Yeah, yeah. He, I mean, as you know, because you've seen him play a million times, there were, like, quick switches in the middle of a song. Um, and, it's, I mean, it's really amazing to see because everyone's just watching him like a hawk. Mm -hmm. That's kind of... Yeah. Yeah, I think the surrounding band always gets it gets used to um, keeping an eye on him. Right. There's always one eye on Bob. Right. And, and I think there's there's... Differing levels of of how obvious he will signal to right. the band right. what he's doing. Right, it could be very obvious with with one of his famous hand signals. Right, um, right, or it could just be he puts his head down. And I think when he puts his head down, the band knows to watch him. I think right. the audience knows to watch him too. Yeah, yeah. Because when he does that, he's sort of retreating and almost like he he's taking the spotlight for a second. Right, and he he's following through on something he's feeling or thinking. Yeah, that's beautiful. Excellent. Well, uh, another thing that we're here to talk about is a concept called neurodiversity. Uh, the reason why I, I'm here to talk about that is that I wrote a book, Neurotribes, uh, The Legacy of Autism and the Future of Neurodiversity. Okay, what is that last word for people who don't know? Um, what my book is, is it's the first in-depth social history of autism. So I look at the way that the scope of the diagnosis has changed and the way that societal attitudes towards autistic people uh, have changed over the years. Um, and something that happened, uh, the 20th century was a very dark time for people with autism and their families generally. Um, the standard treatment for autism was, was institutionalization, which wasn't, of course, treatment at all. Um, and families were shamed because they were told that they had given their kids autism by not being loving enough, so it was a horrible time. But eventually what happened was autistic adults were able to start talking to each other on the newly emerging internet in the 1990s. 
And what they figured out by talking to each other was that a lot of the problems that they were having and the challenges they were facing in life were not quote unquote symptoms of their autism, but it was symptoms of the way that society was failing to meet their needs or failing to respect them as people really. And so there was a woman in Australia named Judy Singer who started thinking about what's called the social model of disability, which is to look at disability as not solely located in the individual, but in the individual's relationship to society. And she noticed that all the words about autism were sort of medicalizing and bad. So autism spectrum disorder, disorder, disorder. So people had no way of describing themselves without sort of automatically pathologizing themselves. So she was thinking about biodiversity, which is uh, a virtue in a living community like a rainforest. And she thought, what if society needs all kinds of different minds working together to really be successful? So she coined the word neurodiversity, which she hoped would spread like a rallying cry through not just the community of autistic people and their families, but people with dyslexia, ADHD, all these other diagnoses, in the same way that uh, slogans like black is beautiful or gay is good or sisterhood is powerful had spread through other marginalized communities. And there is a direct tie-in, I think, uh, between the Grateful Dead and neurodiversity, which is... Uh, besides the fact that over the years, I noticed that many of the most fanatical tape collectors, like the people that could name, you know, the dates of certain jams or had like literally, I've seen apartments where virtually every wall was covered by cassettes. I miss cassettes. Anyway, um, many of those people looking back, uh, or not many, but several, would have been diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome later. But the Asperger syndrome diagnosis wasn't introduced until really the early 90s. Um, but the guy, sort of the heart of the whole Grateful Dead scene, who I believe was on the spectrum, was Owsley Bear. He was the guy who both really invented modern concert amplification. Like when Bear came on the scene with the dead, concert uh, amplification was terrible. It was basically sort of voice of the theater speakers and and it was Bear who really worked out what we now think of as modern concert sound. He also insisted that the dead tape every performance uh, in part so they could listen back afterwards and improve their playing, but it ended up becoming this incredible archive, which we now all enjoy on archive.org in part, uh, of all the tapes of their recordings. But um, I actually spent time with Bear, and he was an extraordinarily eccent eccentric person, as everyone who knows about him knows, he not only made the best LSD ever made, like better than Sandoz Laboratories, it actually tested purer than Sandoz. And I think that was because he was so exacting. And he was exacting and very willful about everything. He was, at, he was exacting about the incredible sound amplification system that he developed, which eventually became known as the wall of sound. It was kind of completely impractical in a way, because it was so huge and they needed like two different crews running in parallel to set it up. But it was unbelievable. It was like the purest concert sound anybody had ever heard. And he was equally exacting about his espressos. I, he, he stayed at a hotel that a friend of mine worked at. And like after the first morning, Owsley stayed there for a month. After the first morning, he wouldn't let anyone make his own espresso except him. He would go behind the counter. And he had, you know, he only ate meat. He was like the anti-vegetarian. So he was very willful and very exacting, but he really helped give the Grateful Dead the technical means to become majestic. And also he gave them the means in the recordings to make it into the future with all this great music. So he provided this like precise and exacting foundation for the dead who themselves were not at all precise. Right. Yeah, right. And, and, and that's very much like a, mar a marriage made in heaven because right. because I think the dead needed someone like Owsley, yeah. and and Owsley needed someone like the, the dead, so he could he could create something and then have someone else yeah and t take it from there, so to speak. Right, and then the audience took it from there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, I really do think that deadheads helped create what, and so did they. You know, I mean, they they would uh, the band members would talk about how they didn't feel like the thing that they were doing was located only in themselves, like in the documentary that's coming out, Phil talks about how 
he would literally get musical ideas from people in the audience just watching them dance and stuff and perhaps telepathic, you know, in certain states of mind. <laughs> um, he would get musical ideas and then riff off of those while he was uh, playing. Yeah, the concept of neurodiversity, I think, is 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 is, is what the Grateful Dead is. It's this it's this collective of of no one has the same opinion mm -hmm. everyone is welcoming everyone is opening is open and and musically they're open pers personally they're open i think conceptually philosophically yeah. um it's 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 a it's a very welcoming group mind yeah and that you know in a sense that uh helped to change social values like they carried some of the openness that was associated with the 60s but it wasn't a nostalgia trip at all. It was always about uh, the future. And, you know, so the thrill of being a deadhead on tour was that you would hear the band sort of reincarnate itself in a new form with new, you know, new effects on the guitars or whatever. And so they always came back in a way that was both fam familiar because they were playing the songs you loved, but completely new and going to completely new places in the improvised uh, jamming section. So. It was uh, it was wonderful, and I I miss like that source of news, you know, particularly because we're living in a shall we say a difficult time, you know. I miss being able to go to the shows and sort of recharge my myself for the future. Yeah, the anticipation, the experience, and then and then the sort of the, the thought processing afterwards. Right. I, I miss that too. Um, so. Over the past 10 or 15 years, you've really been exploring the concept of neurodiversity. Mm -hmm. You've been a deadhead longer far longer than, than that. that. Yeah. So how did, how did all, of your, all of your research, did you find it affecting in any way that you were sort of enjoying the Grateful Dead um, or even processing or d were you discovering new things like, oh, that makes sense now? Well, one of the things that, um, that I researched in the course of writing Neurotribes was the history of the disability rights movement. And I had always appreciated the fact that there was an area of shows that was called the deaf zone for uh, deadheads who were deaf who would hold balloons so that they could feel the vibrations of the music oh, wow. and so they could enjoy the music tactily. And they would have a sign language interpreter interpreting the lyrics. And um, I came to really appreciate that they had made that accommodation so that uh, deadheads who were deaf could join the party basically and appreciate the music in their own way and uh you know as i say over the years of of uh researching autism i came to look back at some people who i knew like i i really think something like dead bass um is an expression of what hans asperger uh, the guy who really discovered autism in vienna in the 1930s would have called autistic intelligence um it's this very exacting sort of uh taxonomical if that's a word you know or very organized very precise way of organizing this chaos of what the grateful dead did all those years and um there's also so you know since we're in the at the 92nd street y there's also something talmudic about dead base and dead, deadheads jewish deadheads have like talmudic conversations about which is the better version of scarlet fire or whatever um but uh you know i really do feel that one of Bob Weir's mottos of the Grateful Dead and the Dead scene was misfit power. And neurodiversity is another way of saying misfit power because it was not meant only to apply to people on the autism spectrum, but you know, people who march to different drummers and experience the world in different ways and experience their senses in different ways. And the Dead r radiated a kind of welcoming attitude towards people who are different. And, uh, you know, for instance, I'm gay. And even though there weren't that many out gay deadheads when I was young, uh, I felt like the, the welcoming attitude of the community could also include me if I wanted to be there. And obviously I did want to be there a lot. And um, so I felt like that whole inclusive ethic was very American and very not in accord with the emphases of the current administration, I have to say but that the essence of why the Grateful Dead were uh, an amazing American band was that they included all these different types of music in their own music and included all these different types of people in their audience. 
and I think they were um, they were v- they were turned on by very classically um, American pieces of 20th century art, yeah. um, literature, for example. I, I they they were thrilled to meet Neil Cassidy, for example, right. and and to be to be his friend. And when they would invite people like Ornette Coleman, right. to to play with them. That was amazing. I was at that show last night. It was <laughs> wonderful show. Yeah, it was uh, amazing. So I I I one thing that I admired from them, even when I was younger, and and seeing them live, um, I I got that back then. Yeah. It's like there's nothing more American than this. Right. And I always thought it was it was not threatening, almost like funny that the reputation they had amongst straight, right. straight, straight people, right. like straight laced people that all oh, this is just a bunch of like weird people running around the country. It's like, yeah, exactly. And America was built on weird people running around the country. Right. <laughs> and it was, you know, I remember a mountain girl, Carolyn Garcia, uh, Jerry's one of Jerry's great loves said that uh, talked about a self-selecting system for weirdness like deadheads would sort of self-select out of society like you would kind of figure out that you were a deadhead and often the first you know the first signs of that was that you were kind of weird and you felt like you didn't get you weren't you didn't fit in any clique you know in high school you had hopes for a more interesting life (laughs) than what straight society was offering you and uh, still you know one of the most wonderful things about being an older deadhead now is that i meet kids who were way too young to have ever seen jerry but boy are they ever deadheads they totally get it they totally get the music they have probably a better knowledge of some of the you know uh specific tapes than i do but they get it so i think that legacy is really carrying itself forward into the future i think you just have to look around at just like in the past year or two or three just the number of projects that have come out around the grateful dead uh, the continued popularity of of the dead and their their musical um, musical projects and splinter groups and look at Fare Thee Well. So I was at Fare Thee Well um, on the last night, July fifth, and I was at Soldier Field for the Grateful Dead's final two concerts in 1995. Oh wow! And uh, so I I have vivid memories of those 95 shows. Just <laughs> the way you know the way the sun was hitting the crowd, just the way the city looked from our far in the back seats and you had a lot of elbow room back then as you did at um stadium shows in the 90s just because y- there's a lot of room there but at fairly well in 2015 every inch of soldier field of the new soldier field was w- was filled it was everyone wanted to be there and i've in in the many stadium concerts i've been to mostly grateful dead concerts throughout the 90s i have never felt like what I felt at Fare Thee Well, which was just this overwhelming sense of positivity. And it was almost timeless in the sense that there was it w- there was a reunion sense to it, but there was also a, we're looking forward to the future and we needed this. And here we are in the present enjoying this. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? That, uh, no, not yet. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of the points that um, I think your, the album project, ma- Day of the Dead, makes, is that carrying on the Grateful Dead's legacy uh, does not have to sound on the surface like the Grateful Dead. It can be expressed in its own language relevant to now. I was kind of blown away by uh, Estimated Profit. Can you tell us a little bit about that version of Estimated Profit? Yeah, well, I mean, Estimated Profit arrived <laughs> fully formed in our in our inboxes from the Rileys, Terry Riley, and and his son and um and do you know that phil and and uh, terry riley knew each other back in the day well phil kn- I, th- I think he knew steve rice oh steve rice yes right. steve rice yeah, exactly also right, which, right. yeah one of but uh, that one of the other th- phil two or three came great, from that right. exactly phil phil came from that uh sphere of music you could say and also very interesting because steve rice's music is so precise yeah it involves phasing steve yeah. rice's music is very precise but it, it it plays with 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 that precision in a, in yeah. a fun way, yeah. and in a way, what it really is is um, improvising on precision. And right. I think Phil really took that into the dead. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, so with with estimated profit, anyone that's heard the the Riley's version of it on Day of the Dead, it does not sound at all like an estimated profit performed by the Grateful Dead between 1977 and 1995. It, it's it's its own beautifully unusual entity. 
It sounds almost like sacred Indian music. Uh, yeah, there's a there's which Terry Riley studied when he was a young man. Right. Yeah. So that was one example where I was so happy to hear it because I, I for me, the songs that that are on Day of the Dead that that are very clearly took inspiration as a jump that and uh, as a jumping off point. Yeah. To me, was just beautiful and inspiring. Yeah. Well, w- one of the nice developments in recent times is that young hip musicians can admit that they like the dead, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, the, the Lee Ronaldo actually uh, sort of pioneered that because Sonic Youth was considered very cool, very, you know, not, uh, you know, hippy dippy or something. But he was like, yeah, I used to go to shows, you know. And uh, so it's great to see that uh, because I feel like a lot of the media, while particularly while Jerry was alive, was kind of clueless and talked about their music as it was as if it was like a nostalgia trip, and um, you know it's funny. I, I just ran into Mickey a couple of weeks ago at uh, SF Jazz, and I, and uh, we were talking about the documentary, and I said, "What do you think?" And one of the things that he said was, "Well, it's about the past, and we're still about the future." So you know, I, I really uh, admire that attitude that they're still looking for the next thing. Yeah, that, that's what's governed them from the beginning. Um, you had brought up the acid tests earlier. I mean, even then, they went into the acid tests thinking we're, we're, we're not necessarily going to play a normal show. Right. Um, if they felt like playing, they would get up and play. And if right. they got up on stage, what they felt like playing, if it was just freaking out, if it was um, feedback, right. <laughs> they, right. Would, they would do that. Right. Um, I, I think they've always been driven um, by by never looking back and, right. and, and it's something that an outsider has trouble grasping because it does seem like such a nostalgia trip right, right. when you're looking at it from the outside right um no but it's you know when we were also one of the sessions for day of the dead ira from yola tango oh yeah came in love and them so and they're a jam band too really you know well and they they very yeah. much straddle uh you know a, a cool indie uh, yeah. aesthetic as well as they like their their music is very much informed by improvisation, right? And so we recorded, and then we had lunch, and we sit down. So Ira, tell us about you and the Grateful Dead, right? <laughs> and he's just like, well, and it told us these great stories about seeing them in the early seventies, mm. the famous Roosevelt Stadium show in seventy four in Jersey City. I was there. That was my second show after Watkins Glen. Yeah, I mean, ba- basically, it was during Eyes of the World, which was, by the way. In the first set, I think it was like the third song, Phil started taking a bass lead, and that was the moment that I became a deadhead. Like, I'm listening to this bass lead in the third song of a very long show. I had never heard a bass player take a lead. Like, I'd heard bass solos. They're generally boring, usually, unless it was Jacob Astorius or somebody. But, you know, so Phil is playing a bass lead riding on this bed of incredibly tight improvisation, I had never heard anything like that in my life. And that was the moment that I said, like, you know, this is who I am, really. This is what I like. I've never heard anything like that. This is what I want out of music. Yeah, yeah. Well, both Ira and Lee separately told me how they went to shows. I think Lee kept up with it. Um, Ira did not. He said that the hiatus came in 75. Mm -hmm. And when the dead came back, he was at that point, he had been he turned to punk. Yeah, and yeah, he was yeah. into punk and new wave, and that yeah. was his focus. Yeah. And he said that it was decades later that it, he started to think, "Oh wow, yeah." Um, yeah. He, re- he he rediscovered his love for the Grateful Dead quietly, right, right, and right. And, and let it inform the music of um, of Yola Tango. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I saw Yola Tango at the Fillmore, of course, the Dead's old, you know, uh, hallowed uh, venue, and uh, they played like a beautiful acoustic first set that you know anybody who likes American Beauty like would have dug that. And then they played a completely out there, feedback drenched second set electric, uh, which I would have hoped that anyone who liked drums in space at least uh, would have been able to appreciate. Yeah. Great. I mean, is there anything else on neurodiversity we want to discuss? Or I think we've. Well, there's a lot more to discuss, but uh, I'll be uh, at the 92nd Street Y here in New York City uh, tomorrow night. Um, I think tickets are still available, so if you want to. Hear me and Ira Flatow and Gail Saltz talk about neurodiversity in depth. Um, that's a place to do it. All right. Um, Steve, Annie, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Conrad.